Life on our planet is constantly evolving. This process has been ongoing indefinitely. Periods of extinction always follow periods of development. But in the history of our planet, there was a moment when development was so prolonged that it gave rise to enormous creatures that dominated for 150 million years. This period was a paradise on Earth because there were practically no extinctions then. The Jurassic period saw the dawn of a group of reptiles that still mesmerize with their sizes, dinosaurs. This is the story of the era of dinosaurs. About 210 million years ago, the once unified supercontinent Pangaea began to break apart into separate continental blocks. It formed two large supercontinents, Laurasia and Gondwana. 50 million years later, these parts would also start to separate from each other. Australia separated from a part called Gondwana. Similarly, Laurasia was divided into what we now know as North America and Eurasia. These changes divided the inhabitants of our planet into different parts. This gave rise to various new species of mammals because the environmental conditions changed for all of them. Seas began to form between them, which had different characteristics from the world ocean. In some of them, the water was slightly warmer than in the oceans. This allowed marine inhabitants to choose their habitat depending on their preferences. During this period, plants accustomed to a warmer climate spread almost all over the Earth. However, there were places that were much colder than the average temperature on the planet. For example, in parts of Siberia, numerous groups of ferns endured fairly strong frosts. Today, modern relatives of such ferns cannot withstand frost and low temperatures. Nonetheless, a large part of our planet had a warmer climate. High temperatures led to the emergence of a huge number of new plants that were previously unknown to our world. There was particularly abundant vegetation in high latitudes because, in addition to high temperatures, there was also sufficiently high humidity. Such a climate allowed jungles and forests to develop, which later became one of the most important elements of the dinosaur diet. Conifers, ferns, palms, various pines, and araucarias. All of these developed during the Jurassic period. The landscapes of the Earth at that time seem unreal, but that's exactly how our planet was 150 million years ago. But life flourished not only on the surface of the land. Deep underwater, it also began to transform. Bivalve mollusks began to fill all the niches of the seabed. Ammonites and belemnites began to spread at an unprecedented rate. They were numerous and diverse. New sea urchins, algae, bryozoans, and foraminifera began to appear as well. But not only small creatures flourished during that period. The Jurassic period was a true paradise for ichthyosaurs, pliosaurs, and plesiosaurs. One of such creatures was the Leopleurodon. It could rightly be called the ruler of the seas. Being the most dangerous predator of the Jurassic period, it instilled fear and terror in all marine inhabitants. It had a large and narrow head. This skull shape allowed it to be incredibly streamlined, reducing friction with water. Four powerful fins helped it propel through the water and made it an exceptionally good swimmer. The swimming style of the Leopleurodon provided it with great speed and agility, which are essential for a hunter. Feeding on large marine fish, it was the fiercest marine inhabitant of the Jurassic period. Another large inhabitant was the ichthyosaur. Its average length was about five meters. Its unique head structure allowed it to squeeze into deep places under rocks, where it could also feast on mollusks. But considering the strength and sharpness of its teeth, it can be concluded that it preferred to eat medium-sized fish. Often moving in packs, ichthyosaurs could reach speeds of 45 kilometers per hour. This speed allowed them to catch any prey they desired. 
life in the lakes and rivers of the Jurassic period also thrived. There was a multitude of different crocodile species that spread widely across the globe. They had long snouts and sharp teeth, capable of hunting both in water and on land. This significantly increased the diversity of their diet. Tail fins allowed crocodiles to move quickly underwater, and on land, these fins could serve as excellent weapons, enabling them to strike their opponents. Here, on the river, there was a place not only for animals, but also for plants. This flower belongs to the genus of giant pitcher plants. Its diameter could reach 40 centimeters. Growing in the tropical waters of the Amazon, its main task was to attract animals for pollination. This is another way through which plants can reproduce. As it gets darker, it's the perfect time to start attracting insects. Emitting a strong pineapple scent, it literally lures various river inhabitants. Beetles are no exception. Landing on the pitcher plant, they squeeze inside, through the outer petals, into the heart of the flower. There, they can enjoy the juicy flesh of the flower. But the beetle doesn't come empty-handed. It brings pollen. Pollen from another flower. During feeding, this pollen gets onto the flower's reproductive organs. At dawn, the flower closes, to reopen later, in the evening, but already completely transformed. Its color has changed, the main goal is achieved, and the beetle, covered in pollen, moves on to other flowers. Unknowingly, it begins to pollinate them. About 140 million years ago, flowers began to spread massively across the planet. Gradually, they became brighter, more colorful, and with a more enticing scent. They provided food for a large number of insects, which in turn were a key element of their reproduction. Vast thickets began to be covered with various colors, made possible only by flowers. Today on our planet, there are 10 times more flowering plants than all other species combined. The world started to play with new colors. The beauty of our planet could best be observed from the air, and during the Jurassic period, there were those who could do it from the height of their flight. Pterosaurs. These flying reptiles were called pterodactyls, externally resembling a modern bird with a large beak, wings, and long front and short hind limbs. The elongated thin skull and straight long jaws with sharp conical teeth allowed the pterodactyl to successfully hunt its prey. Unlike modern birds, its wings did not have feathers. It was skin, like that of a bat. Such a structure allowed them to glide better in the air and spend less effort maintaining their flight. The wingspan of such wings was about one meter. Such large wings, relative to the weight of the pterodactyl, which averaged about five kilograms, allowed them to stay in the air for a long time. But sometimes they still had to descend to the ground. After all, they needed to eat. The diet of these creatures mostly consisted of fish, but they also occasionally caught small lizards. To observe prey from the height of flight, nature endowed pterodactyls with sharp vision. These early birds preferred a slow and peaceful way of life. But what is really interesting is that not only wings united them with bats. Like bats, they slept hanging upside down on trees, but if the pterodactyl had uniquely similar characteristics to bats, then other representatives had traits that resembled nothing else, like the tupandactyl, which had a huge crest on its head, or the pteranodon, which had a sharp and thin horn on its head. Scientists still argue about what such unusual forms were necessary for. But sometimes on our planet, you need to be as inconspicuous as possible. This baby diplodocus has just hatched. It is tiny, no bigger than an orange. But an Allosaurus is already hunting for it. If it finds it, the Diplodocus won't survive. All that's left is to wait and be as unnoticed as possible. The Allosaurus's large nostrils 
allow it to sense its target from a great distance. But nature is on the side of the Diplodocus as heavy rain washes away all traces. The danger has passed, and the Diplodocus can reunite with other babies like itself. During their lifetime, from being a creature the size of an orange, Diplodocuses grew to 25 meters in length. This makes them one of the largest dinosaurs in the entire history of these creatures' existence. Their sizes were so enormous that other inhabitants of the Jurassic period didn't even think about attacking them. It fed on plant-based food, with ferns and other low-lying plants forming the basis of its diet. Nevertheless, it didn't disdain foliage from trees either, but only if there wasn't tastier low-lying flora nearby. By the way, reaching leaves on tall trees was effortless for the Diplodocus, as its neck was of incredible proportions, around 10 meters long. In addition to being able to eat leaves from tall trees, the Diplodocus could also spot potential predators from a very long distance. Often traveling in herds, this skill could save the entire Diplodocus family. Despite their powerful appearance, the stomachs of Diplodocuses were quite small and unable to digest the large volume of food they ingested. To aid digestion, Diplodocuses swallowed stones. These helped grind the food in their stomachs making the digestion process easier. After all, maintaining an 80-ton organism requires consuming a large amount of food. But while Diplodocuses were relatively peaceful towards other creatures, the next dinosaurs were some of the first fierce predators on our planet. Both of them inhabited the territory of present-day USA. These were the Ceratosaur and the Allosaur. And there was always a battle between them as both wanted to be at the top of the food chain. Ceratosaur, translated from Greek, means horned lizard, and it did indeed have a horn, or even several. Thanks to its horns, it could gore its opponents like a rhinoceros. But it wasn't just the horns that gave it an advantage over its enemies. Its feet had huge, sharp claws, allowing it to firmly grasp its prey and prevent it from slipping away. With a body length of six meters, ceratosaurs were excellent hunters, attacking herbivorous dinosaurs, as well as feeding on fish and carrion. Despite their good hunting abilities, ceratosaurs primarily attacked in packs, allowing them to hunt more massive dinosaurs. But the true gladiator of the Jurassic period was the allosaur, this predatory dinosaur was larger than the ceratosaur. Its powerful jaws had the greatest bite force among all dinosaurs of that time. And dozens of large, sharp teeth left scars on the bodies of opponents from which they couldn't survive. Allosaurs averaged eight meters in length, and their height was almost four meters. Its powerful hind legs and relatively lightweight body allowed it to reach high speeds. Such speed helped them conduct successful hunts, especially in packs, where they could literally chase their opponents in long pursuits at high speeds. Working in packs was one of the most necessary skills for the inhabitants of that era. By gathering in large herds, dinosaurs greatly increased their chances of survival. However, the success of the herd depended directly on the unity of all its members and some creatures excelled in this better than others. These were ants, and there were incredibly many of them. They all worked towards a single goal, improving the life of their colony. But sometimes, to improve their own lives, they had to destroy the lives of others. A scout spotted the target. These were termites, and there were a lot of them too. Approaching their nest, the scout brings good news. It calls the army to war. Like a legion, these ants set off on a hunt. They walk along a clear route right behind their comrade. Arriving at the battlefield, they make their final preparations. And then, the signal to battle. But their opponent turned out not to be so simple, as termites have their defenders who protect the workers. Catching a small ant, they tear it apart but the ants resist successfully, 
striking with their stinger at the weakest point, right between the eyes. With each second of this battle, the number of casualties increases, but still, victory is with the ants, and they drag their prey into the nests. Ants have an incredibly important function for our planet. They are the sanitation workers of the Earth. In just one day, ants can destroy several thousand pest insects. They also consume the dead remains of larvae and other insects, helping to avoid decay processes. Without ants, our planet would be in great danger, but they not only help the planet, but also their kin. After a fierce battle, many relatives are wounded and ants have learned to heal them. They secrete a special secretion from their mouths. This secretion is a natural antibiotic. Thanks to it, they can restore their comrades. Thus, they can quickly rebuild their colony and go to battle again. Time passed and mass changes were occurring on our planet. A new period of our planet began, the Cretaceous period. During this time, the dynasty of dinosaurs reached its full greatness. However, the end of this period marked complete extinction for them. It was the last period of the Mesozoic era. But it was during this period that our planet introduced us to the most famous dinosaurs, the Tyrannosaurus rex, the fiercest predator on our planet. It inhabited the Cretaceous period specifically. Dwelling in North America, this formidable monster deafened the entire planet with its roar. It was a fierce bipedal predator with a massive skull, balanced by a long, heavy and rigid tail. Compared to the large hind limbs of this lizard, its front limbs were quite small. But they had two clawed fingers, allowing the Tyrannosaurus rex to grasp its prey with its front limbs and not let go. Tyrannosaurus rex is one of the most studied dinosaurs on our planet. Thanks to a large number of excavations, the skeleton of the largest specimen ever found was reconstructed. It measured 12 meters in length, and its weight was about 9.5 tons. But despite all this, this predator was quite agile and fast, leaving no chance for its opponents. Being the largest carnivore in its ecosystem, the Tyrannosaurus rex was a super predator. It hunted ceratopsians and sauropods, but it could also feed on carrion, left by battles between other dinosaurs. The Earth during the Cretaceous period continued to evolve. Globally, surface temperatures were rising, but in some regions of our planet, there was a real winter, especially in the northern parts of our planet, where a large amount of snow fell. One of the reasons for such abrupt changes was the ongoing breakup of the continent Pangaea. The two huge continents, Laurasia and Gondwana, began to break up into even smaller parts. These parts almost resembled our current planet. Some of these continents moved further away from the equator, such as Antarctica. But the continents that remained at the equator continued to thrive. And on these continents, flowers continued to flourish. If previously beetles were the main lovers of their delicacies, now new insects appeared that fed on them. These were bees and butterflies. These small insects were just beginning to spread. At that time, they were few in number, but already quite beautiful. The population of small animals increased. The floral vegetation formed large, dense thickets where small rodents hid. This was the most numerous order of mammals. They spent most of their lives in burrows to avoid becoming prey to snakes or lizards. The marine world of the Cretaceous period also continued to evolve. This period was literally teeming with various marine inhabitants, from small fish to large aquatic creatures. Crabs began to crawl along coral reefs, and coral reefs turned into bright and colorful places which looked the same as they do now. The Cretaceous period became a paradise for small fish. After all, a large number of huge fish died out at its beginning. Nevertheless, some species of Jurassic plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs still existed in the seas. Their large bodies struck fear into marine inhabitants. 
and force them to quickly change their course. After all, all marine inhabitants understood that encountering their huge jaws would be fatal. There were no rivals from other species for them, only they themselves could become rivals to each other. But if these representatives gradually became extinct, then sharks began to occupy their niche. They were smaller and more agile. Their bodies were streamlined, allowing them to maneuver better in the water, pursuing prey. But not all inhabitants of the sea preferred to constantly reside in it. Some of them could inhabit both on land and in water, like, for example, the Spinosaurus. This dinosaur was notable for its huge, sail-like structure on its back. To this day, scientists have not come to a unanimous opinion regarding its function. With an average length of 12 meters, the Spinosaurus was a sufficiently fierce predator of that time. It possessed powerful jaws, which were studded with large and sharp teeth and were well suited for grasping slippery, wriggling prey, such as fish or amphibians. And its small front limbs allowed it to capture prey, as there were sharp claws on the ends of its fingers. Its bones were dense and hard, allowing it to swim well. Its main food source was fish, which it pursued by propelling itself through the water with powerful limbs. But sometimes, the Spinosaurus could also attack other creatures, even flying ones. Its only problem was its sail-like structure. It practically always gave away its owner's presence. Therefore, it was quite difficult for the Spinosaurus to remain unnoticed during its hunt. However, another coastal inhabitant of the Cretaceous period did not have such a problem. This was the main crocodile of the Cretaceous period, the Sarcosuchus. It inhabited the rivers of Gondwana, which were a perfect hunting ground for it. It could reach a length of 12 meters and weigh over four tons. Its dark green, dense skin was not only a great way to conceal itself from enemies, but also protected it from the bites of some dinosaur species. The structure of its head was typical for all crocodiles. Thanks to its narrow snout, it was more hydrodynamic, allowing it to quickly change its position, ambushing its prey in different locations. For their survival, Sarcosuchus were cunning animals. They would lay in ambush near the shore and wait for the right moment to pounce on any creature that came to visit them without suspecting anything. The world on the land of the Cretaceous period continued to flourish. Due to the breakup of the giant continents, smaller continents formed. The vegetation there could vary significantly. Somewhere in the cold parts of our planet, there was practically no vegetation, while in warmer places, there was an incredibly diverse range of it. The vegetation reached its peak in areas with a tropical, humid climate. The slopes of hills and lowlands were covered with dense forests. Trees served not only to produce oxygen, but also acted as excellent camouflage, and for many dinosaurs, they were the main source of food. It was in such warm climatic conditions that abelisaurids lived. Predominantly, abelisaurids lived only in the southern hemisphere of the Earth. They were a clade of theropod dinosaurs from the ceratosaur group. The main prey of these predators were young sauropods and small mammals, or their remains. One of the most popular abelisaurids was Carnotaurus. These dinosaurs had two unusual horns on their head, but despite all this, they practically had no arms. This limited them in their way of obtaining food, since they could not grasp other dinosaurs, but they had a large number of teeth, which were perfectly suited for tearing off pieces of meat. Another popular abelisaurid was Majungasaurus. This unusual predator had a small horn on its forehead and unusual bulldog-like jaws with which they could easily strangle large and strong prey. They were very aggressive, and often even towards their own kind. These were some of the few dinosaurs that were definitely cannibals. Stable conditions on planet Earth allowed some dinosaurs to reach incredibly large sizes. 
For example, in South America lived one of the largest dinosaurs on our planet. It's not hard to guess where its remains were found, given its name, Argentinosaurus. This giant could reach 35 meters in length. With its long neck, it could feed on foliage from trees as high as 20 meters. That's why its habitat was Argentina. The climate in those regions was ideal for the growth of such large trees. Despite its slowness, which was largely due to the size of the Argentinosaurus, it ate quite quickly. They didn't waste time chewing. They tore leaves off trees and immediately consumed vegetation, consuming up to 50 kilograms per day. Their large size allowed them to retain food in their digestive tract for a long time, providing them with the energy to keep growing. Argentinosaurus preferred to move in herds of approximately six individuals. This allowed them to avoid becoming prey for other inhabitants of our planet. But they always left a trail behind, not only on the surface of the Earth. The crowns of trees after the passage of Argentinosaurus were devastated. And if tall trees were devastated after Argentinosaurus, then after Triceratops, all small trees and bushes were empty. It's easy to recognize it from the wide variety of dinosaurs. After all, it had three horns on its face. It looked very much like a rhinoceros. Probably its horns served as protection against predators. Thus, it could defend itself against its enemies. To grind food, Triceratops had several rows of teeth, and their total number could reach up to 800 pieces. Imagine the planet of that time, flourishing, incredibly beautiful, without exhaust gases from industries. The sunsets of that time were incredibly beautiful, and in the night sky, every star was visible. Closer to the stars were the flying inhabitants of the Cretaceous period. There were a huge number of them at that time. Many of them practically had no feathers, but they had strong bones that helped them maintain flight. They were incredibly diverse. The main rulers of the skies were the Ajdarkids. Their aerodynamic body was perfectly designed for flight. The wingspan of the largest representative among them was about 12 meters. Such a characteristic belonged to Quetzalcoatlus, a huge flying monster. It was capable of making long flights over long distances. Often it fed on fish, but it could also devour dinosaur remains, coming into conflict with others eager to feast on them. It may seem that there was no place for love in the world of the past, but that's not true. Even the most ferocious creatures could be incredibly affectionate, although it might be hard to notice at first. It seems like these tyrannosaurs are about to engage in a battle, but that's not the case. One of them is a female, and winning the love of this female is the main goal for the male. He shows the highest degree of trust. He exposes his neck. Thus, he becomes defenseless, as just one bite could lead to his inevitable death. But the female liked him, and they embraced in a burst of love. Dinosaurs were the true owners of the Earth. These creatures ruled for 150 million years on our entire planet. They gave us such a variety of beings that it's hard to imagine, but they weren't the only ones living at that time. In the shadow of the giants lived representatives of our class, mammals. Their small size didn't allow them to compete with the huge dinosaurs, but even then, they were able to adapt to such harsh conditions, adaptation being exactly what would give them life a little later. In modern Australia, you can still see what our planet was like before. Numbat, a dwindling species of marsupials. Today, there are only 3,000 individuals left, and all of them don't mind feasting on termites. The more it eats, the more it can feed its baby. Unlike dinosaurs, mammals gave birth to live young and nursed them with their milk rather than hatching eggs. But not only dinosaurs could hunt small mammals. Snakes were among them. Some of them possessed deadly venom, while others had the ability to suffocate their prey. 
there were also those that practically didn't hunt mammals and could easily prey on small dinosaurs, like the Titanoboa, the largest snake in the history of the planet. Sneaking into burrows, snakes could devour mammals right in their homes. With such competitors, Numbat pups were in great danger, but mother always stayed vigilant, and with her call, she warned her baby of the danger. In an instant, they moved away together from the snake. Reptiles were very patient throughout their lives. Their patience forced mammals to develop skills that would help them survive. Reaction was one of them. The rattlesnake could wait for the perfect time to attack for hours. It relied on the warmth emanating from rodents. But kangaroo rats didn't get their name for nothing. The snake's instant attack and the mammal's instant jump away. Who knows how the fate of mammals would have turned out? Perhaps they would have remained in the shadow of dinosaurs, and the entire history of the Earth would have forced them to hide in burrows. But something happened that no living creature on the planet could have expected. A huge meteorite was approaching our planet, and 66 million years ago, it reached it. Falling near the territory of present-day Mexico, it set off a chain of reactions on Earth that completely destroyed all life. After colliding with the Earth, our world plunged into darkness. The impulse from the impact spread across the entire globe. Because of this, a huge number of volcanoes became active. Molten magma began to splash over the surface of the land. Billions of tons of rock vaporized in an instant and were ejected into the atmosphere as ash and soot. It became so dark on our planet that it was difficult to distinguish between night and day. Due to the lack of light, plants practically stopped photosynthesizing for two years because they simply couldn't see sunlight. This greatly affected the amount of vegetation on our planet. Only a small amount of it could survive in such extreme conditions. The dust cloud grew larger and larger. Dinosaurs, once huge creatures, began to die out. It can be said with a high degree of certainty that the inhabitants of North America practically became extinct immediately after the meteorite impact. After all, they were closest to the impact site. Other dinosaurs found themselves in an even worse position. They literally had nowhere to hide from the suffocating smog that spread across the planet. After all, unlike mammals, they couldn't burrow underground. Mass extinction also occurred underwater. The disappearance of phytoplankton due to the lack of sunlight led to the destruction of food chains and the death of marine animals. The global air temperature initially rose sharply due to massive lava eruptions and then plummeted rapidly. For decades, it did not rise above five degrees Celsius. The world forever lost its giant dinosaurs. Now it's time for other creatures to dominate, those that were once on the sidelines. It was time for mammals, how they managed to completely occupy the niche of dinosaurs and why exactly they were able to conquer the entire world. Watch in our next video.